the Laguna Wardena informs rice producers that rice will have to be imported if stocks are not released. Coconut will not be imported. Steps will be taken to provide coconut at a concessionary price. Minister in charge of coconut puts forward a solution. Preparations afoot to hand over vehicle permits worth 300 million each to 79 novice MPs. The Hilabudu Savia writes to the President. Chinese Ambassador meets Minister of Justice. American Ambassador meets the Speaker and the Minister of Power. Hello there, very good evening and welcome to Primetime News on TV1. Those for the headlines now news in detail. Showers and strong winds are expected to enhance during the weekend. We cross over Raz Razan from the newsroom for the weather update. Let's now take a look at your weather forecast for the next few days. Now, due to the southwest monsoon being active in the vicinity of Sri Lanka, the prevailing rainy weather condition in the country will enhance tomorrow. And the mid department says that heavy rainfall and strong winds can be experienced during this time period. If you take a look at the sea areas, the sea areas are going to be rough, and the sea areas are going to experience heavy rainfall and strong winds of up to 70 to 80 kilometers per hour. And the mid department has requested the fishing and the naval communities to be vigilant in this regard. A low pressure area is developing towards the north of the Bengal Bay. We urge the fishermen and communities living along coastlines to be vigilant of the weather conditions. The risk of lightning and thunder is low. However, strong winds are expected to enhance in several areas. We must be vigilant of falling trees. We urge the public to refrain from staying outdoors. Trade Minister Bandulagunawadana today warned rice producers that if steps are not taken to release rice stocks to the market, measures will be taken by the government to import rice to Sri Lanka. A meeting was held between the minister, rice producers, wholesale rice traders and officials attached to the Ministry of Agriculture in order to discuss concerns regarding the supply of rice to the market. The government does not plan on increasing the maximum retail price as the public will not be happy with the such a move. We did not allow prices to exceed 60 rupees per kilo and producers did not purchase rice for more than 30 rupees per kilo. We did not have an issue as the prices were maintained between 30 and 60 rupees. In my view, paddy has been purchased at a higher cost, resulting in higher production price. The government is now being forced to increase the maximum retail price. <laughs> We need 280,000 metric tons of paddy every month. 3.2 million metric tons of paddy was produced during the last month's paddy season. We need 2.8 million metric tons of paddy annually. The monthly cultivating season produced 400,000 metric tons of paddy as well. There is an excess of 2.2 million metric tons of paddy remaining from this year's season. I informed you of this matter, Minister. Ultimately, I am blamed for this. I urge you to inspect our mills and warehouses and show us where these so-called paddy stocks are. According to what is claimed, there should be millions of metric tons of paddy stocks. There is an intermediary network. This network is not releasing the stocks of paddy to the market. This intermediary network is not releasing the stocks because we have always raised the prices. There is no reason to panic. The quantity of paddy claimed to have been produced in the country is not true. I do not agree with the methodology that is being used to quantify the paddy produced in the country. I have the largest stock of paddy. You can send your officials to my warehouses to inspect these. In a few months, I will be labelled as a culprit. This is why I urge you to convene a discussion so this matter could be discussed. <laughs> There is no shortage in paddy. They have already been purchased at a higher rate. However, we are aware that certain parties have hidden stocks of paddy. If the stocks are not released, we need to formulate a strategy to ensure they are released. The price of rice will not be increased under any circumstance. The government must maintain stocks as a precautionary measure. 
at least for a few days. We should import and maintain sufficient stocks and ensure that the control price is maintained. This is the only way we could address this issue. If this situation continues, it will lead to a rice shortage. We will be unable to purchase paddy as well. The government would never allow for an artificial rice shortage to be created and rice would be imported in order to prevent a price hike. The Samagi Jana Balavega expressed these views regarding the surge in coconut prices in the market. Mama, I visited a shop this morning and inquired about the price of some essential items. A coconut is now 100 rupees. Imagine if the price of a coconut was 100 rupees back then. It would have made headlines. The government pledged to give out a relief pack. So why doesn't the government include the coconut in the relief package? Meanwhile, the State Minister of Coconut, Arundika Fernando, expressed his views on the surge in coconut prices. The State Minister made these comments while reaching the top of a coconut tree in his garden using a device made by a resident of Varakapola. The country is facing a shortage of 700 million coconuts and the main reason for the shortage is the high demand in local industries and domestic consumption. Sri Lanka has an annual domestic coconut production of 2.8 billion coconuts. 1.8 billion coconuts are needed for consumption purposes. We hope to utilize every available plot of land for the cultivation of coconuts and the boost of the industry to one which would generate foreign exchange to the country. We need to increase the coconut cultivation. In response to the present price issue, the government government aims to take several steps to reduce prices. after the state minister got out of the coconut tree the designer elaborated about the creation Against a backdrop where the price of rice and coconut are in doubt, preparations are afoot to provide 79 novice MPs with duty-free permits worth 300 million rupees each. Addressing a letter to President Gotabe Rajapaksa, the chairman of the Hela Bodhusavya organization, Venerable Budugala Jinavansa Thera, pointed out that at a time when the general public are facing so many issues, it is unfair to provide such duty-free permits to MPs. The letter highlights the plight of the people who are now purchasing half a coconut as they cannot afford to purchase an entire coconut for 100 rupees. It adds that the president is well aware of the fact that prices of food items such as rice and dal have also increased. Venerable Budugala Jinavansathera said that certain cabinet ministers have already said that they cannot provide short-term concessions to the general public on food prices. The Venerable Thera also highlights the fact that about 300,000 people have lost their jobs and many factory employees are only receiving half of their monthly wage. Venerable Budugala
Srinivan Safera requested the president to focus on providing concessions to the general public than working for the welfare of ministers and MPs. The Venerable Thero also points out that if money from the MPs consolidated fund is used, the general public can be given more concessions. Meanwhile, the Secretary to the Ministry of Public Services, Provincial Councils and Local Government, JJ Ratnasiri said that as vehicle imports have been halted, there are no preparations to give any duty-free vehicle permits to MPs. Sri Lanka's geopolitics. Several diplomatic meetings took place today. A meeting between the Minister of Justice, President's Council Ali Sabri, and the First Secretary of the Chinese Embassy in Sri Lanka, Rang Xiong, took place at the Ministry of Justice today. The Chinese delegation discussed the assistance provided by the Chinese government for the development of the judiciary in Sri Lanka and assured that such assistance will be provided in the future as well. Discussions were held on the new court complex to be constructed as a solution to the shortage of space in the court buildings and the dilapidated condition of the buildings. Meanwhile, U.S. Ambassador to Sri Lanka, Elena B. Teplitz, met with Speaker Mahinda Yapa Abewardana today. Country Director of the U.S. Agency for International Development, Reid Ashiman, and Political Officer of the Embassy, Jeffrey Shining, were also present at the occasion. Meanwhile, U.S. Ambassador to Sri Lanka, Elena B. Teplitz, speaking with Sri Lanka's Minister of Power, Dallas Alaha Peruma, said that U.S. is ready to provide all the required support to develop Sri Lanka's national power grid. The U.S. Ambassador met with the Minister today, along with Chief Economic Officer at the Embassy, Susan Walk. Minister Dallas Alaha Peruma and the U.S. Ambassador held broad discussions on the development of the power sector in the country. The Minister said that plans are afoot to increase the contribution of clean energy to the grid to 70% and reduce diesel-generated power to 5%. Chief Economic Officer at the Embassy, Susan Walk, said that the U.S. hopes to provide technological support for the development of renewable energy in the country and added that U.S. investors have focused their attention on Sri Lanka to launch new renewable energy projects. She added that they hope to introduce a concessionary loan scheme for such projects. On the 25th of June, US Ambassador Elena B. Teplitz met with the then Minister of Power Mahinda Amravira. Even then, the government announced that the US Ambassador had agreed to support Sri Lanka to develop an LNG power plant. What is behind the sudden interest of the United States in Sri Lanka's power sector? A group led by Charita Ratwatta, the Millennium Challenge Corporation of the United States of America, in partnership with Harvard University's Center for International Development, prepared an analyst report of the much-debated MCC Compact. The report prepared in 2017 was called Constraints Analysis Report. According to the report, land access, political instability and high cost of transportation were identified as obstacles in the development process. The group had proposed to spend 480 million US dollars to develop land and transport systems through the Millennium Challenge Corporation Compact. This report identifies other issues. Electricity is also included in this report. Electricity supply is one of the projects implemented by MCC across the globe. They are also trying to embark on a power generation project in Nepal. Benin, Liberia, Ghana and Malawi are countries that have already implemented such projects. Due to the opposition to the land and transport projects they have already proposed in Sri Lanka, it is suspicious if there is an attempt to apply the MCC agreement to the power sector. China says it is conducting military exercise near the Taiwan Strait to protect its sovereignty as a top U.S. official visits Taiwan. The live fire drills take place as relations between Beijing and Washington turn sour and the U.S. show up its support of Taiwan. U.S. Undersecretary of State Keith Crouch arrived in Taipei yesterday afternoon and is the most senior State Department official to visit the island in 41 years. Beijing said the visit violated the U.S. one-China policy and the three communiques that form the basis of U.S.-China ties. China's Defense Ministry spokesperson accused the U.S. and Taiwan of stepping up collusion, frequently causing disturbances, although he did not make any references to the visit. Today, in this era of great power competition, the Department of Defense has prioritized China as our top strategic competitors. These revisionist power using predatory economics, political subversion, and military force in an attempt to shift the balance of power in their favor and often at the expense of others. 
China, for example, is exerting its malign influence through its One Belt, One Road initiative. This campaign has left weaker nations with crushing debt, forcing them to take their economic relief at the expense of their sovereignty. Additionally, Beijing's aggression and disregard for its commitments in the South and East China Seas, such as the sinkings of a Vietnamese vessel and the escorting of Chinese fishing fleets into the exclusive economic zones of Indonesia and Philippines, are further examples of the Communist Party's attempts to reshape and undermine the international order that has benefited nations large and small. Meanwhile, the Defense Secretary added that the U.S. military is shifting its attention to the Indo-Pacific region, not only because it's a hub of global trade and commerce, but also the epicenter of great power and competition with China. The case filed against two individuals, including former Minister Basil Rajapaksa, regarding a house in Malwana, was taken up at the Gampa High Court today. Basil Rajapaksa appeared in court today. One of the witnesses in the case, Mudita Jayakudi, through his attorneys, requested court to give him another day to testify as he is suffering from mental and physical ailments. The case will be taken up on the 20th of November this year. <laughs> The Secretary General of Parliament, Neil Idavella, said the draft 20th Amendment to the Constitution will be included in the Parliament agenda for the 22nd of September. He said it will be included in the agenda for the first reading. <laughs> President Rajapaksa is trying to amend a constitution that does not suit this country. When we look at some of the decisions taken by certain leaders in the past, there were many instances where public assets were looted. I agree that there are certain drawbacks. However, these shortcomings will be addressed as we go forward. Certain members of Sajid Premadasa's faction is holding discussions with the ruling party, which could pave the way for the ruling party to secure more than a two-thirds majority. <laughs> The 20th Amendment to the Constitution is only temporary. We should establish a new Constitution which would address all the drawbacks of the current one. The people gave us their mandate to repeal the 19th Amendment, and it should be repealed. The commissions that were established to the 19th Amendment were a failure. They were not practical. We will bring forward a new constitution that would enable the government to establish and operate these commissions in a practical manner. I am of the stance that the 19th Amendment should be repealed. Identifying the author of the amendment is not what's important. Only those who are politically helpless highlight such matters. <laughs> The 20th Amendment has no author. It does not even allow the Prime Minister to present his report to the Cabinet. Apparently, the Cabinet has said that the report was not required. If this is how the Prime Minister is treated before the 20th Amendment is brought into effect, I wonder what will happen to the Prime Minister after the 20th Amendment is implemented. Those who decide to vote in favour of the amendment must understand that this will result in all of them losing their parliamentary powers. All parliamentary financial powers will be removed from Parliament. The Audit Commission will be abolished. Are they trying to play the same game they played before 2015? <laughs> Former Defence Secretary Hemisri Fernando has claimed that he did not receive or observe a threat to national security in the warnings received before last year's April 21st attacks. This was in a testimony at the Presidential Commission probing the April 21st attacks today. Giving evidence, former Defence Secretary Hemisri Fernando claimed he did not observe a significant threat to the country's security although several incidents had taken place in the run-up to the bombings. Fernando said he had understood the massive explosive haul in Vanata Villua, the Kartankuri bicycle explosion and the murder of two policemen in Vaunativu as isolated incidents that occurred days before the attacks. He argued that it was the responsibility of the Chief of National Intelligence to provide him with an analytical report by piecing these incidents together. The witness alleged that the former Chief of National Intelligence, Cicero Mendes, had admitted that he was not well versed with the intelligence-related matters as well. The former Defence Secretary told investigators he assumed that these warnings were unsubstantiated and had been prepared on assumptions. 
Additional Solicitor General Ayesh Arjuna Sena questioned the former Defence Secretary on why he could not take action against Zaharan Hashim under the Prevention of Terrorism Act and the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. In response, Fernando admitted that he had not read these acts, although it could have been used by him in his capacity as the Secretary of Defence. A heated situation arose at an auction held at the Ambalangur Urban Council premises today. The cause of the commotion was a single rupee. <laughs> Scrap metal was auctioned off at the Ambalangura Urban Council premises this morning. During the auction of a batch of this scrap metal, one party had bid a single rupee more than the bid made by another party per kilogram. This led to a clash between a group including the Deputy Chairman of the Municipal Council, Kamal Village, and the highest bidder. <laughs> I came from Kurundagaha. They attacked me suddenly from behind and I couldn't do anything. A kilo of iron was sold to us at 36 rupees at the auction. We came here as Sinhalese, Muslims and burghers. We condemned this attack. This public auction started at 10 in the morning. We asked them to show us the government approved estimated price, but they did not show it to us. However, Ambalangud Urban Council Deputy Chairman Kamal Velage later said that the auction had been suspended. There was no incident here. There was no assault or any other incident. They caused damage inside the council. We did not wish to lose the revenue of the council. However, since the mayor was not at the place, I had to intervene and instruct the officials to suspend the auction. While politicians quarrel among each other for power, the issues faced by the people are still unresolved. Residents of Gallene Vata Thumpani for three decades have had to purchase water for money. Drinking water here costs 200 rupees, 500 rupees to have a bath. A water project was launched for these people. This project was due to conclude in 2021. However, political reasons intervened and the project was shifted to Puttalam. The project that was launched here was stopped short. Residents of Thumpane have no other choice but to walk two to three kilometers to purchase water at exorbitant rates. Indigenous people live in the village of Manke in Batiklo. 120 families live here. Land that these people use to cultivate on have been declared as protected land and these people cannot even enter them now. However, the biggest problem faced by these people is the lack of clean drinking water. The people have to travel two kilometers to reach the reservoir. The people here ask for a system for them to help them access clean drinking water. Residents of Velodia and Dumvelodia in Munaragala have been suffering without clean drinking water for years. They have to get water from a reservoir located over a kilometer away. The water here is also not clean. Wells in these villages are empty. These people are suffering without clean water. A tense situation arose during the opening ceremony of the newly constructed Divisional Secretariat building in Hopatale today.
The tense situation occurred between two groups in the same political faction. The auspicious time for declaring the building open was set at 10 in the morning. Minister of Labour Nimal Siripala de Silva and MP Sudarshan Adhanapitiya were present at the event. Shortly afterwards, the Habutali organiser of the Sri Lanka Pudhujana Perumuna, Janaka Tissakutyarachi, arrived at the location. I am the organiser of this. I am also a member of parliament. They called me the day before yesterday. Does that mean that I should stop everything else and come here? I need to know who made this decision. The ceremony began shortly after the group inspected the building. If I had not attended this event, there will be rumours that Minister Nimal Siripara de Silva and Sudarshana Denipitiya attended instead of Tissakuti Arachi. I am not afraid of anyone. The President did not vote for me nor did the Prime Minister. However, I will serve the 51,151 people who voted for me. Don't insult us by bringing us to these places. I don't engage in cheap politics. I am a businessman. I didn't buy a hotel and I didn't sell alcohol during curfew. I am not a man who works like that. I work in a right and ethical way. I attended the opening ceremony of this division of secretariat building for the people of the Badulla district. It wasn't because of anything else. 140,000 people placed their trust in me. I have to say that when I was invited, I gave priority to the district despite the heavy political workload I have. The president is taking a path towards depoliticizing the people. We have to adapt to it if we like it or not. We have to respect his policies. <laughs> Sri Lankan Airlines Shaman Ashok Patirage spoke to Bloomberg on how the carrier is coping up with the impact of the coronavirus pandemic. So nobody can predict at the moment, but uh, you know it all depends on how you know how the world is going to get this COVID uh, situation under control. But we we are operating on cargo. And we are also bringing a lot of uh, Sri Lankans who are stuck in the other country. So we operate a lot of repatriation flights. In terms of turnover, like to like, we are about 75% down. So that means we are about 25% of the last year's turnover at the same time. From our perspective, we have taken many measures. Just like other airlines, we have taken lots of uh, initiatives to cut costs. We have renegotiated with uh, our lessors, you know, we are there uh, various salaries for employees, we are given pay cards. We are also sitting with almost about a billion dollars of debt, so which is by predominantly to, to the government. So government banks, we own government bank, and then uh, we have raised money through international bond, which is being guaranteed by the, uh, you know, uh, to the government. So basically, right, I mean, you know, most of the debt are related to the government. So I think we are, in the, we, we are talking to the government, as you know, that the country or economy also has got hampered uh, by the COVID. So the this may not be the best time to in terms of, you know, either capitalizing the existing debt or, you know, putting new capital. Another house constructed under the Sirius AFM housing project was handed over to a listener's family this morning. This fully equipped house built in Kumbukka Gonapala in Horana was handed over to Nidhi Kadil Rukshi and Ruan Prasanjit. Group Director of Electronic Media Business of the Capital Maharaja Group, Nidra Virasingha, Channel Head of Sirius FM, Sajit Ratnaika, and several senior officials, including Officer in Charge of Projects at the West Security Forces Headquarters, Colonel Tushan Ganepola, and a group of other high ranking officials were present at the event. The dreams of Nidhi Kadil Rukshi and Ruan Prasanjit to own their own house were realized today. A tribute to the newly appointed Navy Commander Vice Admiral Nishanta Uluge Thanna was organized at Royal College in Colombo today. Vice Admiral Nishanta Uluge Thanna is the 24th Navy Commander of Sri Lanka.
it is important to note that school children have become a lucrative target for drugs. This menace comes in various forms. I urge you to be very, very careful because I have seen what drugs can do to life. So-called prospective people have ruined their life and family simply due to the addiction. It's menace that we should fight together. An epistle was presented to the commander of the Navy, Vice Admiral Nishanta Ulugetan. <laughs> The much-awaited Indian Premier League cricket tournament, which was postponed on several occasions, will begin in Dubai tomorrow. The tournament will end on the 10th of November. We leave you tonight with a look back at how the difference of a single rupee led to a heated situation in Ambalangudu today. For the Newsworth team, I'm Martin Satyanason, along with sign language interpreter Tharaka Gabriel. Take care and good night. A tense situation arose between two factions at an auction held at the Ambalangud Urban Council premises today. <laughs> The issue ended with the deputy chairman of the Ambalangud Urban Council, Kamal Velagi, suspending the auction. 